in this chapter is about cryptography. I'm going to cover it, but not in great depth because we do have an entire class on cryptography. So I will cover some of the aspects of it. First of all, has anyone had cryptography yet? A couple of you? Okay. In here, I know both of them had. I'm assuming some of you online have. All right. Cryptography is the process of converting plain text into ciphertext. Okay. So we have an entire class on this. And you know, nowadays, pretty much everything you do should be encrypted. And an easy way to tell if what you're doing is encrypted is, for instance, here's our Canvas page for this class. You'll see a lock up here. I can click on it right here, and it tells me this is a secure connection, which means it's encrypted. And I can click on this, and I can you know, view the certificate and see this valid until Jan or December 2020. So, yeah, whenever you're using something on the internet now, make sure you got this locked. It's kind of important. Okay, so the process of converting plain text to ciphertext. Plain text is the text we can see. It's the stuff we can read, like in a book. Ciphertext is the jumbled up version of everything, okay? And do I have Wireshark still installed? Let's see if I have Wireshark on here real quick. I might have it. If I do, I'm gonna capture a little bit of traffic real fast. If it loads. Oh, I didn't do it with, oh, this is Windows 7. I don't need running it's at. Whatever. Does it just need, it seems like there's always a new version of Wireshark available. I just installed the new version the other day. Run as admin. So let's let that run. Okay, here it is. Okay, I'm going to look at my local area connection here. And I have a bunch of traffic going on. Now, on this right hand side, you'll see TLS, it means it's encrypted. I'm just going to stop it right here. And I'm just going to pick up this data right here. Look at this. Look at all that data. Can you read this data at all? No, you can't. And if I was to follow the TCP stream right here, I mean, you can't read any of that. None of that is in clear text. Most of it is probably audio video data. Right, it's probably audio video from Zoom, but either way, it's encrypted, so you will not be able to read it. And you can actually even follow the TLS stream. Okay, then this doesn't have any in it, but so, you yeah. know. What it means is you can't read the data. That's pretty much what we want to happen. Okay. So again, cryptography is to hide data. Then decryption is the process of converting it back to plain text. Okay. Pretty easy stuff. Started way back when, thousands of years ago. I mean, we talk about Caesar ciphers on the bottom of the screen here. It's one of the very first substitution ciphers. What they did is they shifted the alphabet by three. I should have put a picture of that one in here, but I didn't. C A E C A R cipher. I'm sure we can see a picture of it there. So basically, the letter D became A, and E became B, and F became C, so on and so forth. So it's shifted over by three. So pretty easy to follow there. Here's you know the plain text. So treaty impossible becomes W. U, H, D, W, B, so on and so forth. The T becomes W because it's shifted by three. The R becomes U because it's shifted by three. Okay, so that's basic Caesar, Caesar cipher stuff there. Okay, all right, cryptanalysis, study of breaking algorithms. Okay, so a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to break these, and a lot of people have broken them. When it's a new one's developed, you know, crypto study and figure out how to break it or prove it can't be or possibly break. Now, I put a picture here of the Enigma machine. Um, if you have not seen the movie yet, uh, Imitation Game, oh, absolutely amazing movie. I don't know, did I put a link to it in the classroom? I couldn't remember if I did or not. If you haven't watched it yet, this is the game, the movie right here, Imitation Game with a Cumberbund, Benedict Cumber, Cumberbatch, I keep calling Cumberbund. Excellent movie. Um, a little far-fetched on some of the stuff they do, um, but it's really good. It gives you, you know, for the most part, it's correct what they cover in the movie. I happened to just walk, I was up at AMC 24 in uh, Edmond watching a movie, and oh my God, it was terrible. I don't remember the title, it was terrible. So we walked out and just 
walked into a random theater and an imitation game was playing. So it's excellent. And I had a student a couple of semesters ago complain about the movie. He says, you suck. He says, because he watched it, then he had to watch it with his wife, then he had to watch it with his kids, then he had to watch it with his in-laws, because he, he goes, the movie's amazing. So he kept showing it to everybody. He kept watching it over and over and over again. So if you haven't seen Imitation Game, you need to watch it. But it's an encryption based on rotors. And there's also a movie, U571, you might have seen. You can tell I watch a lot of movies. Well, they actually captured an Enigma machine. I don't know if that's true or not, but I know at one point they captured. It was used by the Germans, and it was pretty much an unbreakable code. Okay? And they really broke it based on initialization vector. But again, we talked about that in another class. And the last bullet there says the machine for breaking the code was called the Bumba. Okay? That's really correct. Okay, and if you read the book called The Enigma Machine, they talk about it once, the movie, The Imitation Game, they end up coming up with one. But then they actually got the point where they kept reproducing this machine and making so many of them that no one wanted to break code without one. So they were literally having to produce more and more of them and people stopped trying to break it by hand because the machine was so efficient. And they called them the Bumba. And they, they talked about, you know, if the bomber went down, they just would sit there and do nothing all day because they realized it was, fru you know, fruitile to sit there and try to do it by hand when you had a machine that can do it. So kind of a cool story if you never read, read about the evening machine. Um, there is one up at NIST headquarters. There's also one in another place up in Maryland, um, some museum I went to. Kind of a cool thing. It's also the purple machine developed by the Japanese and you know uses techniques by this herbert guy and just another form of encryption steganography the process of hiding data they really don't cover much in here but we do an entire project on it in another class that's where you encrypt or really not really encrypt you hide data in something in the class we hide it in pictures but you can hide it in text you can hide it you know in Executable files, you can hit it in WAV files, you can actually hide stuff in all kinds of things. So, kind of a cool thing. Okay, so different algorithms. The encryption algorithm is what's used, the mathematical function, to encrypt something. And we're going to talk about some of the different ones here in a minute. It says the algorithm of strength and key secrecy determine the security of it. The key, like in the Caesar case, the key was shift to three. But when we get into like symmetric and asymmetric, you actually have keys. But a key, it could be a sequence of random bits generated from a range of allowable values. Not always true, but it could be. And a larger key space means it's harder to break. Imagine keys for your house. So if you had one key, obviously you could open the door. If you had two keys, you had to 50-50 shot at getting it right the first time. You know, if you got up to, you know, 248 keys, you'd have a long time to open your door. So that's what they call the key space. Here's an example of it here. So depending on the number of keys you have, so two to the third, you know, there's three bits, gives us eight possibilities. And so you know, that's basically an eight-bit key. I'm sorry, a three-bit key, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. They talk about symmetric, asymmetric, and hashing. Symmet and we're going to go into each one of these. Symmetric, same key. So the easy way to think about it, symmetric starts with S, so it's the same key. It's very fast for encryption and decryption, and it's very popular to use today, like AES is a symmetric encryption. Okay? It's faster, difficult to break with large size keys. Disadvantages, they talk about key management. Now think about the keys, for instance. Say the password was popcorn. Okay? Or the key was popcorn. You would have to keep that word secret and never share it with anybody because once the word got out, then people could use it to break it. Okay? So managing keys is tough. Also, key distribution is an issue. You know, I got Quinn sitting here in the classroom. I could get him a key quite easily because he's right here. But what if I had to get someone a key, you know, where Wesley's fixing the move to Russia? That would be more difficult to get there. So, okay. difficult to deliver keys without risk of theft, does not support authenticity or non-repudiation. What, anybody know what non-repudiation is? Someone's got to know. Not, or, I, I know it's hard to um, Hard to know non-repudiation? Non um, like, 
can't deny that you've done something. Exactly. You can't deny you did something. Okay. I know you did it. And asymmetric does not support that. Because, you know, if the key gets compromised, well, you know, so, but yeah, you really, it doesn't support that. Now, um, they also have different types of algorithms. They have stream ciphers and block ciphers. Stream ciphers, think of it like typing. Every time I type a key, it's going to be encrypted. So it encrypts the stream of data. Okay. Block ciphers have to get an entire block and then encrypt it. So which one's better? Well, it really depends. So they both have uses. Now they get into DES, Data Encryption Standard. It was a NIST standard for quite a while. It was actually made by IBM. Um, they, the NIST basically went out and said, hey, we need an algorithm. So IBM came up with a algorithm called Lucifer. And I added the comment on there. It's really based upon the demon cipher. So the reason they called it Lucifer is because demon is what? It's a demon, so they called it Lucifer. But why was it called demon? Does anyone know? Does anyone remember from the class? Well, the, the algorithm was actually called demonstration. But they were limited on the length of the name, so they shortened it to demon. So uh, it says 128 bit key, but then it was shortened. And you know, they, they brought it down to 64 bit. Okay became a standard, but then it was broken, and it's actually still used today, but will never be certified really for use. Yes, yeah, to 56. They finally did bring it down to 56. So. Okay, triple DES is like using DES three times. You encrypt with one key, decrypt with a different key, re-encrypt with the first key again. So it's actually much better, and that is still used today as well. It says, takes longer to encrypt and decrypt data than DES. Obviously, I mean, triple DES takes longer than single DES? Yeah, obviously. Okay. AES, the current winner out there. It says, put out a request for a new standard. It had to, you know, it says, symmetric block cipher can be capable of supporting 128, 192, and 256-bit keys. So they came out with... Rigendale, Mars, RC6, Serpent, and Twofish. Rigendale is the cipher that won and became RES. Okay. Um, there's also IDEA, another block cipher, 64 bit, 128 bit key, made by this Massey guy. It's free for non commercial use, so it's good use there. Blowfish is another one, 64 bit. But look at the key length. The key length is up to 448 bits. That's crazy. Okay. Developed for public use, then we have RC4, then we're not going to talk about each one of these, then RC5, and, you know, Reves did that, did that one there. Okay, asymmetric algorithms. I put a picture up there of PGP, because PGP happens to be one of the most popular asymmetric algorithms. So data encrypted with one key can only be decrypted with the other. Okay, so symmetric, we just talked about AES, for instance. You use the same key to encrypt and decrypt, okay? So use the same exact key. With asymmetric, you use a different key. So you encrypt with one and decrypt with a different one. So like in the second bullet here, the public key, you can go on um, uh, keyforserver.pgp.com and publish your key. You publish your public key. So if Quinn over here wanted to send me something, what he could do is he could download my public key off of PGP he could encrypt the message with my public key, then I'm the only one that can decrypt with my private key because they work in a pair, okay? And if he encrypted it also with his, really what ends up happening is he encrypts it with my public key and he would sign it with his key. Then I would download his public key, then I would know it came to me because I it was encrypted with my key, but then I know it came from him because he signed it with his key. So it gives you that whole non-repudiation thing we're missing in the other algorithm. It's a lot slower than symmetric, but uh, if you think about it, you know, I showed you an example of a certificate a minute ago. That uses a key, okay? And it actually uses a public key. So we have to have some capability, you know, th there's no way we could publish every key to everywhere. It would, it would take forever. Can you imagine your bank they had to have a separate certificate and key for every single user. 
that would take forever. So what they do is they use a asymmetric algorithm. They publish their key with a certificate authority, which we'll get into. Then we can verify the authenticity of a bank just by checking the certificate authority. Much easier. Okay. Provides authenticity and non-repudiation. Okay. Means the user cannot deny sending the message. Now, that's not always true. So what happened if you know, me and Quinn are using PGP here and someone gets access to his computer or his key? Well, then you know it's kind of out the you know out of the water there. So really, cannot deny it as long as the public the private keys are not you know given out. Okay, yeah. Okay, it says user encrypts a message with a private key and sends it to user B. User B decrypts the message with the user A's public key. Then I know it came from user A. The confidentiality is the concern. So like I said, you encrypt a message with the B's public key and sends it to B. B decrypts the message with his oh, private key. So pretty much I just talked about. So RSA, developed in 1977 by Bravesh, Shamir, and Alderman. It's the first algorithm used for both encryption and digital signatures. Okay. It says most browsers support TLS and uses RSA as well. Also uses a one-way function to generate a key. I put a note in here, was RSA the first public key algorithm? They do hold a patent on RSA as a public key algorithm. So is, was it the first one? Does anybody know? It wasn't. Tell me who it was in an email. I'll give you extra credit. Who created the first public key algorithm? If you have the crypto class, you should know the answer. If you don't, you're failing. Okay. Um, maybe I'll tell you about it next week. Someone remind me and I'll tell you the answer next week. Okay. So Diffie-Hellman, another asymmetric algorithm. What's good about Diffie-Hellman is it's used for key exchange. So via the internet, you can actually exchange a key through a public internet and get it there you know, without being exploited. So kind of a cool algorithm. We do cover that in the other class as well. Okay. So, all right. It says if a key intercept during transmission, network is vulnerable to attack, but Diffie-Hellman allows that to happen. Okay. Elliptic curve, user encryption, key distribution as well. Elliptic curve is good on memory, disk space, bandwidth, digital signatures. And I think, let me see something here. Let me go to Facebook real quick. I think. Let's look at the algorithm behind Facebook. Okay, so it's using SHA-256 RSA. It's using elliptic curve cryptography 256B. That's their public key, or 256 bits. So Facebook is using that. Now, Here's what's cool. Okay, watch this. So Facebook is using elliptic curve with 256 bits. Okay, just remember that. Now let's go to D2L. Unless they changed it. Watch, they changed it now. Let's look at their certificate. Oh, lost my thing. There we go. Let's look at the, there. Let's go down to the pad. Okay, so D2L is using RSA 2048 bit, where Facebook is using elliptic curve at 256 bit. Which would you trust more? Actually, elliptic, I can't say the word, elliptic curve is better performance, especially with bandwidth and other stuff. So a lot of places are switching to elliptic, elliptic, man, that's hard to say, okay. It's in that word. It's just real good for digital signatures, bandwidth, stuff like that. So, all right, El Gamal is another one. It's used to generate keys, encrypt data, so on and so forth. Been in 1985. Now let's talk about digital signatures. Well, a digital signature allows us to send a message and prove the authenticity of the message. It enables a public key to decrypt a message encrypted with a private key. 
the public key can decrypt a message encrypt with the private key. So again, we're talking asymmetric still, only if the message is encrypted with a corresponding key. But now let's look at this example. See if this Gloria creates a message to send to Paul. Gloria gets a hash value of the message. Okay. Gloria's private key encrypts the hash value. Paul decrypts the hash value with Gloria's public key. Then Paul calculates the hash on the message, on the Gloria's message, the original message, and then knows that it's legit. If he's able to decrypt it and it matches, it's the same. So the message was never encrypted. What they did was they created a hash value of it, which is a mathematical calculation, something like MD5, and they encrypt the hash value. So the message goes across, but the hash is encrypted. And when it's the hash is decrypted on the other end, they, if the hash is matched, then they know it's good. Okay. All right. DSS 1991 ensures digital signatures can be verified. Then the they, you know the government started using it and it's using SHA, you know, all that. So very popular. Here they talk about PGP. PGP is also used. It's a free email encryption program. You can get, uh, can't think of the name of it. What's the, pretty good, yep, uh, there's another one. GPG is the other. I was thinking of the open source. That's GPG. Okay, and if you read the book called Crypto, you'll learn that Phil Zimmerman came out with PGP version one, and the government freaked out because they couldn't break it. And he was getting ready to release version two and the government told him, do not release it outside the United States. He posted on a bulletin board and instantly it was worldwide. Okay. Uh, so it was almost arrested, any kind of unbeggable encryption. Did anyone remember, I don't know, a lot of you are young. Did anyone use the internet in mid nineties? Were you guys even alive then? Jeez. I used the computer in the nineties. Okay. Do you remember when we first had Internet Explorer, you could not download, I think it was the 128-bit, unless you were inside the United States? It was considered a weapon. There you go. Yeah, it was a weapon. So, yeah, it was it's crazy. So, the, you were not allowed to, like I said, release something with good cryptography, you know, good encryption built in. So, yeah. So, it was, it was kind of a cool thing. And you couldn't sell, like, Nobel or some of the off. Product. You couldn't sell Lotus Notes either until they, they changed all that. He got, so around, crazy the, he got around the ban by uh, putting the code into a, a written format, a booklet, and then uh, it was optical character recognition, and then he published the booklet, which was covered under his First Amendment right. That's oh. how he got around, the, he circumvented the ban. Nice. And that, that's where he posted it online, so that's kind of cool. Okay, so, so PGP, there's also Open PGP. And there's also GPG. There's lots of different versions out there, but they use a centralized authority. Let's go, let me show you what that is. So here, if I went to keystore.pgp.com, uh, did I spell it wrong? Should be there. Should be keystore.pgp.com. There's open PG. Oh, key server. Ah, that's what it is, key server. My key is expired. Does anyone happen to have a key? Greg, do you have a key by any chance? No, sir. Ah. Oh, oh, great. <laughs> P-A-E-R-R. -R. Try code again. R-O-M. You only got to do the code once. Okay, let's find one. Someone's got to have a key. I have a key. Oh, you do? What's your key, William? Uh, yes, right. Go to the go to the MIT directory. How do, where is that one at? What's the well, try try wmsright at gmail. It should find it with just that. Find it? Is it searching? Yeah, mine's, mine's registered through MIT. Just just put MIT PGP directory in the There you go. Okay. Okay, there's his key. 
There's this public key right here. You actually have two of them. That's an old one. And if you download this, there's his key right here. Okay. And that's what Again, his you'll see, my, you'll see the signature too. And it's now, now what this is, this is a public key. So if I wanted to send something securely to William, I would take this right here. I would use a program like um, uh, Open PGP or Open. There's lots of them out there, and I would use put this in as his key. Then he would be the only one able to read the message. So, kind of a cool thing. Okay. Uh, PGP supports you know Open PGP. Open PGP. And I keep saying the wrong. It's AS IDEA RSA supports a lot of them. S mine is a way of encrypting our email. It's like I said, encrypts email. You can use PGP or PKI certificates built into Outlook. Okay. Um, it says making a policy change to exchange text results and sensitive documents in encrypted form. Okay. So allows us to send stuff back and forth. Okay. Hashing algorithms. Hashing. I thought I put a picture in there. There should be, maybe it's coming up. I put a picture here in a minute. Hashing all the rooms. This is taking a variable length message and produces a fixed length hash value called a message digest. Okay. And it's like I said, it's like a fingerprint. So there's no two messages that should produce the same hash value. If the message is changed whatsoever, the hash will not work. And if there are two messages that have the same hash value, that's called a collision. MD5 has a known collision, so that's no longer going to be working. Okay. Here's all of them. And do they put into the MD5 has been broken? Yeah, MD5. However, a collision for an MD5 hash can now be found in just a, with just a few machines within a few hours. So it's pretty. It's not really. It's still out there, but they don't recommend it anymore. Okay. Now mm -hmm. let's talk about the infrastructure. Someone say something. Away from the SHA one too. There, everybody's going to SHA two fifty six. Yeah. All right. So SHA two fifty six is where we're going. All right. So. Let's talk about the components of the public key infrastructure. First of all, we need a certificate. We need keys and you know, some issue or basically some place to hold it. So let's, we're gonna talk about each one of these. Okay. Let's talk about some of the issues first. Expiring, revoking, and suspending certificates. That was originally not there. Right now we're using X509 version three, if I remember right. Let's, let's take a look up here. Let's look at their key, I bet it's X509. Oh, it's in here somewhere. Yeah, it's version three, but I know it's X509. Probably just leave that part off. Okay. And you can see here, this certificate is linked all the way back to DigiCert. Let's look at uh, Canvases, for instance. Let's look at their certificate. That one's let's link back there as well. Okay. Um, look at row states. Let's look and see where this certificate's linked to. Naturally, they're all the same darn one. Can't think of a different address to check. How about Yahoo? Let's see where their certificate is. Yahoo is going to be self signed, isn't it? It shouldn't be. They should still have a CA. We're actually going to get to self-signed here in a second, but they should not. Can uh, try, try netlab.francisuttle.edu. It's signed with uh, Let's Encrypt. Oh, take off the S. I'm sorry. I said netlabs. It's netlab. Okay. So let's go here. Now, this is a different one. Let's encrypt authority. Who is this? It's a, it's a service that you can use uh, and generate your own encryption uh, on it's, most Linux boxes pretty easily. It's, it's kind of a slick deal. But it stores it on a regular CA somewhere. Huh. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I've never heard of that one. Okay, so let's go back into here. So the issue with certificates when they first came out was they were good, you know, they would never expire. Like when I used to run my ISP, they issued me a certificate for my website because I used to sell certificates. Mine was good for 10 years. I mean, 
mean, it's crazy the length of time. But what you need to do is like this here, the period of validity is assigned to each certificate. Every certificate needs to expire at some point in time, okay? If the certificate gets compromised in one way, you need to have what's called a CRL, certificate revocation list, to be able to revoke the certificates, okay? Here's reasons to revoke them. User leaves a company, hardware crash causes the key to be lost, private key is compromised, customer or company no longer exists. So CRLs are a big deal, okay? There they talk about CRLs, contains all revoked and suspended certificates and they stay in the list until they expire. Okay. Suspension of a certificate, one or more parties fall, fails to honor an agreement. Tell you a funny story about certificates. I used to sell them and I used to host websites. Let's see if this company is still online. First Marine Division.org, I think. Maybe .com. Okay, that, I don't know if this is it. But I used to host the First Marine Division's website. And yeah, this, one, this isn't the one I hosted. But there are their website, they wanted it to be secure, so I requested a certificate. I went to the certificate authority, at that time it was Komodo, and I registered for a certificate. What you do is you create the request on your computer, and you basically, excuse me, go there, request one, put in the information, all the, you know, all the common name and everything for the certificate, and then once it's approved, they issue you their certificate, then you install it. Well, I sent it to them and they contacted me back and like, hey, we need to see the incorporation papers of the first Marine Division. So I'm like, not a problem, because they want to verify they're really who they are. So I contacted the first Marine Division and said, hey, I need a copy of your corporation paperwork. And they said, okay, it'll take a couple days. This is not a problem. You just don't have a certificate until I get it. Literally two, day, two or three days later, I got an email from Komodo, okay, you've been approved, here's your certificate, and I never sent in the incorporation paperwork. So, and for a couple, quite, quite a period of time, whenever I would request certificates, if they ever asked for incorporation paperwork, I just waited, and they always gave it to me without it. That sucked. That was really, I mean, it was scary. Nowadays, they no longer do that, but that was a flaw in their system. I guess they assumed, you know, you know I'd say, if you ever read a book about eBay, they talk about when eBay first came out, they started this auction thing. But for, you know, when you sold something, you would have to pay the person that you bought it from. And the person you bought it from was supposed to pay eBay. They had nothing in place to guarantee that whatsoever. They didn't have a way of tracking it initially. So they told the sellers, you owe us this much money. They didn't track it whatsoever. They just, told them what they had to owe, and luckily most of them paid, and they would just literally start getting checks in the mail. So it's like, it's crazy stuff, they would actually do that. But, so certificates, really big deal. Okay, HCTB Strict Transport Security came out in 2012. It's a mechanism that basically tells people, hey, we require encryption. Now there's something you probably could find, it's called HTTP Everywhere. If you don't have this, like if you're using Chrome, you probably should get HTTPS everywhere. What this is, it's an extension for your browser that whenever you go to a website, it automatically tells the website, I would like the secure version, please. So kind of cool. Now if the website doesn't support one, well then, okay, it'll still go without it. But it, not all of them, they do not. The MSN didn't a while back, I don't know if they do now. Yeah, they do now even. Well, I, actually, I probably have the extension installed in my profile. So I don't think we can connect without it. Yeah. So, but um, so it's kind of cool. But if you don't have it installed, you probably should. Okay. And so if it's not secure, the browser would disallow access to the website. So and here's an example of looking. I mean, it's terrible. You can't even read anything. But they're showing the, the header field that you can't read. Backing up keys. Backing up's a big deal. If keys are lost and not backed up, you have to basically get a new one. I handled the website for a company where the key got my fault. Key got something happened. A thing was my fault. 
something happened to the key. It was no longer valid. So I had to request a new key. It was going to take 24 hours. And they ran a shopping cart. So I asked them, okay, I can't get a key for 24 hours. So you get a choice. You can turn your shopping cart off for 24 hours, or we can do it without encryption. So what do you think you did? Do it for no encryption. Because he was losing sales otherwise. So, okay. And talk about CAs. Microsoft has a root CA. Actually, a lot of there's a lot of root CAs out there. But you normally go through a third-party CA like um, VeriSign. They're a big one. They're right here. VeriSign's a leader. Also, Komodo's another one. Now, I used Komodo for years, and it was funny because VeriSign would sell a key back then for three forty nine dollars a year. That's a lot of money. Komodo would send, sell an equally sufficient key, in other words, the exact level encryption and everything, for one forty. dollars It was like, no, it was like $108. That's right. So what would you do? Would you go with VeriSign or Komodo? Komodo. So I would... Buy them for 108, sell them for 200 bucks. I made a little bit of profit on them. My customers got a little bit cheaper deal, but uh, you know, there still is a valid CA. Okay. Now, I got a picture of one coming up here in a second. Here's how you can add roles to your server so you can become your own CA. We don't know, we no longer do that project, but you could. And here you're gonna be a root CA or a subordinate CA. Then you gotta select the encryption now. Why now? Maybe do a mind tap left for this and that's Oh, okay, maybe you did. Okay. Now, I asked the question, can I create my own CA? Obviously I can. We just saw we can right here with Microsoft. But is it a good idea? So I could make my own certificate and I could say, Hey, I'm Ken Dewey and I verified myself. But you won't so, be in any of the browsers. Right. It won't be in the browsers because it's not linked to a CA like VeriSign or so on. Here's an example from today. Um, it's like the DOD. DOD has their own certificate authority. So whenever you get an email from someone at Tinker, it pops up and it's like, hey, now we cannot verify this certificate. It's a certificate from the DOD. It's valid until 2029. But since I do not have access to the DOD certificate authority, I cannot verify the validity of the message. Okay. Now, what I can do down here, I can click trust, which at that point would then pretty much install their certificate in my browser. And then from that point on, I could verify them. But uh, I remember when I first started using like TRICARE online with the military, it would pop up, hey, this is not a trusted website. And they would have a link on there, you know, how to install the certificate. Because you can literally download it and install it and you can also trust it. So. It's not a good idea to have your own, but obviously the military has a reason for it. So, okay. All right. Now let's talk about some of the different attacks. Passive attacks is use tools to eavesdrop, perform port scanning. Um, I was running Kane. If you've never seen Kane, I don't even know if we can still get to the website. Let's try it. OSID.IT is the website. There's a project here called Kane. Okay, you can download Kane right. This is the, the one right here. Hasn't been updated in forever, but it still works amazing. Yeah, but if you try to install it, when this machine is going to have a heart attack over it. It's not going to like it. But I was doing a demo of that, showing them how you can capture passwords on, you know, from websites, and then literally capture one on the Rose Network. I'm like, whoa, was it actually captured a live password on the Rose Network? And it wasn't good. <laughs> I mean, it was it was actually a service account, so it wasn't a user password, but still the fact that it was able to capture one is scary. Active attacks is attempt to determine the secret key used to encrypt plain text. And says normally you know the algorithm behind it. it says companies developing encryption algorithms realize vulnerabilities, maybe discovered. And you know, they didn't mention it in here, but we talked about DES. DES was actually built upon secrecy. And AES, on the other hand, was built open source pretty much. So it makes you understand, you know, secrecy doesn't always work. Okay. Something called the birthday attack. Okay. So it says that if there's 23 people in a room, 
there's a 50% probability that two people share the same birthday. You ever notice that? You ever find someone with your same birthday? Yeah, I, a lot of times I've seen that. But go into a room with 50 people, there's a 50% chance that somebody else has the same birthday as you. I think that's, that's not true. Not the same birthday as you, the same, like two people in the room have the same birthday. Right, not right, okay, absolutely. Yeah, good point. Two people in the room have the same birthday, yes. Okay, and this talk, the same kind of thing we're talking about hashes. It says you to find the same hash value and two different inputs. Okay, so it's kind of a kind of a cool thing. Okay, SHA 1, 168 bit key, two to the 63rd computations. Well, let's see how many that is. Ah, well, that's my calculator. Two to the 63rd. So we're going to go over here to scientific. Two to the 63rd. Take that many tries. Okay. For shot one. Okay. Mathematical attacks. This is a property that can be attacked by using mathematical computations. If you know the math behind it, you could potentially break it. Okay. There's ciphertext only. That's where you know only the ciphertext, or there's you know the plain text, or where you know the combination of them, or you know all kinds of different ways there. Brute force, you just try everything. Sit there and try every possible combination. Okay. There's a crossword or a password cracking program, okay. and we have some examples. I'll be showing you in a minute. Okay. Man in the middle attack. You can actually use cane to do that. You can actually it says place themselves between the victim and the host computer and intercept the messages between the victim and the host and pretend to be them. Kane does that very well. Okay. There's also a downgrade attack where you can tell the system to downgrade the encryption okay, and renegotiate it for you to a weaker cipher. Never done much with that one. Birth or dictionary attack, try every word in the dictionary. That's why you should not use words from the dictionary. Replay attack. Uh, I remember way back when we're talking, I don't know, early, yeah, early 90s somewhere. I was uh, taking a networking course, I think it was my master's level, and there was a, a replay attack of sorts that they found. What it was, someone had captured the phone line from an ATM and recorded it and was playing it back to the ATM. And the ATM just kept spinning out money. The way they caught them was there was a guy standing out there with a brown paper bag just collecting the money. They just kept playing the recording over and over and over. So I, I don't know. It was crazy stuff. The replay attack says captures data and attempts to resubmit the captured data. That's why SSL and TLS prevent stuff like that. Okay. Password cracking is illegal in the United States. I'm going to say it's, it's illegal to crack your own. But no one else's. You can use dictionary words. There's a lot of tools out there, and they talk a little bit how Linux stores their, their passwords in the shadow file. Windows stores them in the registry or yeah, in the registry. There's some password cracking tools out there. Hashcat, John the Ripper, Opcrack. Opcrack is free. Actually, the first three are all free. Never tried expect. And whenever you use expect, never try it. Lock crack, yeah, I've used that one before in PWDM7. Out of all those, I know lock crack costs money. The other ones are free, but I think there is a free version of lock crack as well. A lot of different programs out there for breaking passwords. And I don't know why they put this picture on here, but it's a picture of John the Ripper. Okay, great. Here's another picture of John the Ripper. I think they just want to have pictures in there. Okay. All right, that's the end of the chapter on cryptography. Don't anyone go anywhere yet. Let me stop the recording.